with the license holder, with all of them, to really kind of strike a happy medium. And, and you know, with the, with the 40K license, uh, we start off with a lot of research, we invite them over, we, we, de we decide what are the key tenets of the, of the brand that cannot waver. And uh, we have to stick to those. And then once we develop those key tenets, then we start asking ourselves, are any of these things applicable to a third person action combat game? And if they are, um, are they expandable on top of that? And can we build a game on? And that's the first thing we do is, you know, we just don't blindly, you know, we get the license and, and the, one of the first things I do is just start asking those serious questions of, should we make a game out of this? Um, and THQ, who, you know, have worked with a lot of licenses, they, you know, that's, that, uh, that kind of relationship with the license holder and really asking some of those hard questions up front. So you do the research and then you ask yourself what type of game and for, for, Warty, for Warhammer, it was interesting because it was an RTS, well established, right? Um, there's an MMO in the works, you know, there's obviously the tabletop game has been around for years and being an old D&D nerd myself, like, you know, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, but here was a chance to not just appeal to this really loyal fan base, but as a third person action combat game on a console, we have an opportunity to introduce the license to people who've never heard of Warhammer, who are just hardcore console fans that normally would never play, uh, you know, this license because they're not, you know, PC gamers, they're not hardcore MMO guys or tabletop guys. So, um, you know, at THQ, we, we, really, uh, we really kind of ask ourselves up front what we can and can't do with the license, what we should and shouldn't do, and then negotiate that with the, with the license holder and try and come to an agreement. In this case, it worked out. They're very pleased with the vision for the product. Did you want to say something, Jack? I was saying, uh, playing off uh, that point, we encountered a lot of the same issues uh, when I was working in Chrome on the uh, Star Wars, uh, Clone Wars lightsaber um, battles game. And essentially, with uh, LucasArts had a very, um, very uh, big marketing and research department, and we we had to deal very closely with them, and they had a specific set of filters that related to both the Star Wars franchise and both the television series that they um, that they gave to us and that we had to kind of run our ideas through to be able to formulate um, a series of pictures that they would they would kind of uh, look through and, and, and determine what type of game uh, they wanted to make. So uh, yeah, we had to deal very closely with their consumer insights department, and they did a lot of the marketing and focus testing. Yeah, yeah, and they, they, that's what they do. I mean, they, they they spend all their time doing focus groups and marketing and testing, and and uh, they understand their audience better than anybody. And it's up our job as developers to um, just really get involved in that process and, and help negotiate that. And you know, you got to remember we're we're trying to do what's right for the game. They're trying to do what's right for the license, and there is always a happy medium there. But but you have to be willing to uh, to negotiate that and, and and kind of like look for those little nuggets of goodness and bring them up to the surface and actually portray them in the game. Yep. So, so I was just wondering how you check yourself against you know we've all had it before you handling an IP an established IP and as an Australian developer all of us have been handling established IPs for a while we know how to look after someone else's IP. But when a creative team just comes in halfway through the project, you know, marketing that the publishers might have just finished off whatever else they're doing, so they're looking for something to do, and they come in and they say, whoa, 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 whoa. you know, no, you guys aren't sticking with the license, blah, 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 and you've gone over, you know, above and beyond to do that and stick. How do you sort of shield yourself against those sort of attempts? Is this, you've got these key tenants you were saying, much like yep. a Taurus, we have values for the IP, yep. and we use them to check against publisher. Do you have a similar sort of system? We do, we do, and we call them the tenets of the, of the vision. And so, uh, you know, I find that, um, you know, if that's embedded culturally, and, you know, one of the things we did with, with Warhammer was like, you know, up front we said, this game could be 50 different things. It really can. Everybody had an idea. Is it a, you know, shooter? Is it this? Is it that? Um, and really just needs somebody to say, uh, for better or for worse, it is these things. Okay, and, and, and be able to sell that idea. Uh, and 
if you've done that up front, I find personally, in my personal experience, if that's embedded in the culture, the team's wrapped around it, management, everybody knows. Uh, I would say if you can walk into a, a leads meeting and interrupt them and say, what's our game about? And all of them answer the same exact question, then when those things come up and Lord knows they do, you know, the marketing guys show up, you know, we, one guy left the company and a new guy comes in and all of a sudden he's asking why we don't have, you know, multiplayer when we decided a year ago we weren't going to go down that path. But um, you have to fall back on those, those key values, those tenets. And uh, if you've done a good job up front of uh, establishing those and getting and changing the culture of the company, um, that's what shields you most of the time. But it, it is it is going to happen throughout. You know, everybody here has been through it. Well, you 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 go through it, and um, and you just gotta stick your ground a lot of times. And it doesn't always make you the most popular person in the room. But in the end, if you believe in what you're doing, if your team believes in what they're doing, if your company believes. Um, you you know you uh, you hold fast so to speak. Um, yeah, I just wanted to expand on the point you said. Um, hold fast to that point you said earlier about risk analysis. Um, when you said you know you had to look at what analysis license was it actually worth making the gain out of what the key terms were. And I was wondering like what goes into risk analysis? Um, does it add with the start of every project? Because uh, I imagine you know. Um, yeah, like there's a lot that goes into whether yeah. you are going to follow through or you're just going to leave it to the side. How many projects do you get tossed away? Oh, God. <laughs> I always tell the designers, I, uh, I, I use this uh, analogy about, you know, 99% of your ideas are crap. Minor, 99% of all of our ideas are crap. But it's that one, you know, that one that actually makes it through. And uh, for Warhammer, it's interesting because you're, we did have 30 years of literature, illustrations. I mean, it's a deep, rich license. So that was the challenge from risk analysis. This game could be anything because of the amount of weapons that are in the lore, the amount of creatures and races. I mean, it, this thing was huge. So our risk analysis was when we have to strip this thing down to a very clear message, a very clear focus. This game's about melee combat. It's got some ranged elements. It's only about the Imperial Guard. It's about chaos. You know, really, the, the risk was when we take this lush, vast universe, and strip it down to a very focused game, is it still Warhammer? Is it still uh, have the depth that the license demands it, that it has? And we, 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 uh, man, we fought with that for, for a couple months, actually, back and forth of whether it was worth doing. And at the end, we brought Games Workshop in, and again, negotiating with these people who own the license. We brought them into the studio and, and pitched what we wanted to do and said, do you believe that this is still a Warhammer? And when they said, when they told us to get a gold star, I said, all right, that's good enough for me. Uh, you know, there's however many million fans of theirs that, that basically agree with them. So they agree with us. We thought we were, uh, we had an opportunity to uh, please the fan base and introduce it to a new audience. I think a point to underline there, from my experience, is to get the publisher and licensor involved with that session early. If you yeah. Can, uh, because there's a, a real risk in sort of getting the team excited and buying into something and setting something up that you feel delivers uh, what the game needs. And you kind of run silent for a bit and you know, it's, it's happening, it's happening. And then you get that you know, marketing person or brand person or somebody kind of lobby to itself, this is completely off the mark. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, setting yourself up for disaster doing that. I think really, if you can you know, openly discuss those risks, and some of the risks might be, uh, you know, hey, maybe you guys have a change of personnel, someone comes on the project new from a publisher or license or side and just wants to completely, you know, swipe the pieces off the chessboard and start over. Risk might be that you're building a prototype and we've, we're working on a, a fairly combat heavy game at the moment. The combat needs to work. A risk at the end of reproduction, maybe the combat isn't that much fun. Maybe we, we have, you know, this, the way in which we think it's going to work, maybe it doesn't fit with it as well. You need to have a plan, so if this happens, this is what we're going to do. Um, and having that discussion with those people early on and having it all open and visible, because no, nobody wants surprises now. And there are risks and things do go wrong, uh, things do change, uh, but if you can, at least have an attempt at identifying what those things are most likely to be and how you will deal with them should they come up. At least then everyone's kind of on the same team trying to fix the problem and it arises. Yes. Okay. Okay. I was going to say I definitely agree that it's um, good not to leave too many eggs in the publisher's basket. Uh, if, if you give the publisher too much say over, over or present them with too, too many choices, then they're, they're liable to take a long time uh, as with a, a very large and bureaucratic company like LucasArts with many layers of management, a lot of our ideas kind of went through layers 
kind of got changed around by the, by the top of the company, kind of came back 